Hi, everybody. Uh, so today we're going to learn about the incorporation doctrine. It's kind of a complicated idea. Uh, it's a little bit misunderstood, and that's unfortunate because it tells us how the Bill of Rights protects us as the people from the government, specifically from the state governments. So it's very interesting. Uh, so first of all, we know that the word or the word doctrine means it's a legal concept, a legal idea. Incorporation, incorporation can mean making a business into a corporation, but that's not what it means in this context. In this context, it means applying the protections of the Bill of Rights to the states. So just a, a basic outline here. We, here we have the government, and here comes the government to restrict our rights in some way. Here we are, the people. The government wants to restrict our religious liberty or, or restrict our speech or search our house without a warrant. But thankfully, here's the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, protecting us from the government restricting our liberty. All right, it's actually in the first eight amendments. The ninth and tenth amendment are part of the Bill of Rights, but they don't have protections from the government. They do other things. Uh, well, what's interesting is originally the Bill of Rights only protected us from the national government. And we know that we have a federal system of government where we have a powerful national government. We also have a number of state governments with real authority, and that authority might end up restricting our liberty. And originally, the Bill of Rights didn't protect us from them. The Bill of Rights uh, only protected us from the national government. So if the state governments wanted to restrict your gun ownership or restrict your subject you to cruel and unusual punishment or restrict your speech or religion, they perhaps could. All right? Since then, we say the Bill of Rights has been incorporated to the states, meaning it now kind of extends down and protects us from the states. But not always. All right? And this sort of makes sense. A lot of people would say, well, surely if the big bad national government can't do something, the measly state governments can't do it either. But that's a misunderstanding of federalism. The, national gov or the state governments have a lot of powers that the national government doesn't have. So um, this makes more sense if you think about the history of the Constitution. Remember, it was created in 1787, but it didn't become the official government uh, founding document until the debate about whether to ratify it or not. And those that were opposed to ratifying this new Constitution, one of their main complaints was there's no Bill of Rights to protect us from this new, scary national government that's got extra power. So uh, if you would ask them, well, do we need a Bill of Rights to also protect us from the state governments? They would say, no, that, that's not what we're talking about. We're not worried about the state governments. We've been Virginia citizens. We've been Massachusetts citizens, New York citizens for a long time. We're used to that. We're not afraid of that. In fact, some of our states already have their own Bills of Rights. We just need one to protect us from the national government. So originally the Bill of Rights did not protect us from the states. There was actually a Supreme Court case uh, called Barron versus Baltimore, Barron v. Baltimore, that where the Supreme Court specifically said the Bill of Rights does not protect citizens from state governments, just from the national government. But that has changed because we've changed the Constitution since then. We've added amendments. After the Civil War, uh, the the so-called Civil War Amendments, one of, one of them was the 14th Amendment, was added to the Constitution. Uh, it's a really long amendment. Most uh, constitutional scholars think it's the most important part of the Constitution, the most important amendment at least, and it's largely because it does this. It applies the Bill of Rights to the state. It incorporates the Bill of Rights. All right. And there's a couple of clauses, kind of phrases in the 14th Amendment uh, that seem to incorporate the Bill of Rights to the states. The first is the Privileges or Immunities Clause. There it is right there. And then so down here we have, right after it, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Okay? And there was an early attempt after the Civil War, after the 14th Amendment was added, to, to ask the court, hey, does the Privileges or Immunities Clause mean the Bill of Rights protects the, protects the citizens and businesses from state governments? Here it says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. So that sort of sounds like the Bill of Rights protections are our privileges, our immunities. And so in a kind of set of cases called the slaughterhouse cases, some businesses, some slaughterhouses, asked the Supreme Court that. The state of Louisiana had passed a law making a government monopoly on slaughterhouses in uh, New Orleans. And this is an 1873 case, so right after the Civil War and the 14th Amendment. And they said, Do doesn't privileges or immunities, that doesn't that mean the state governments, no state shall, cannot restrict our liberties in this way by taking away our business and giving it to the government? And the Supreme Court said, no, that's not what the privileges or immunities clause means. It means something else. And it made the privileges or immunities clause basically do nothing. Well, 
The story wasn't over yet, though. 50 years later, there was a case called Git Low, G-I-T-L-O-W, versus New York. And this was a 1925 case. And it, what it did was it asked about this other clause, the due process clause. Benjamin Gitlow was a communist, and he was going to publish, he did publish uh, an article in a communist newspaper. His article was called The Left Wing Manifesto. And New York, the state of New York, had a law restricting speech that would incite anarchy. And so New York punishes him under this law and says, your speech, your, your press here, your article is inciting anarchy. All right, so here came the state government to restrict his speech. All right, well... Gitlow's lawyers say, well, what about the First Amendment? What about free speech? What about freedom of the press? And New York argues, First Amendment doesn't protect you from the state government. It protects you from the national government. Well, his lawyers say, well, we can't use the Privileges or Immunities Clause. That was decided in the slaughterhouse cases. What about this phrase that says, nor shall any state deprive any person of liberty without due process of law? Doesn't liberty mean at least free speech in the press? And the Supreme Court said, yes. It said, Liberty, if it means anything, it means speech and press. Those are really important. So get low. Uh, the First Amendment does protect you from the f free speech and free press part of the First Amendment. It does protect you from New York, but not to the extent that they can't punish you for that, uh, inciting anarchy. So New York actually ended up punishing them. But they did say the due process clause of the 14th Amendment forces the states to res restrict, uh, respect freedom of speech and freedom of the press. So, so kind of a big a small piece, I guess, of the Bill of Rights now protected us, extended down here to protect us from the states. There we go. All right. What about the rest? Well, that came up in a case called Palco. Eight years later, a case called Palco v. Connecticut. Oops. Connecticut. This is an 1833 case. And uh, this was involved a guy who, was, who killed two police officers, Frank Palco. And he, the state of Connecticut, again, we're talking about state governments, they put him on trial. They wanted to get first degree, a first-degree murder conviction because first-degree murder is premeditated. It carries a high penalty. They only got second-degree murder, though. So they just put him on trial again and tried again. And they got first-degree murder that time and sentenced him to the electric chair. But you might say, well, that sounds like they just subjected him to double jeopardy. Doesn't the Bill of Rights protect him? Well, maybe they protect, it protects him from the states. So Palco's lawyers asked the court, and the court said, you know what? Only the most fundamental, let's write that word, only the most fundamental Bill of Rights protections are applied to the states by the due process clause. This word liberty right here means the fundamental liberties in the Bill of Rights. And double jeopardy is not fundamental enough. So Palco gets the electric chair as a bit of salt in the wound. His name was actually Palco with an A, and the court documents misspelled his name, so he's in his name's in this famous case and it's getting misspelled all right so it raises the question though what rights are fundamental the court had said only those rights that are essential to a fundamental scheme of ordered liberty was their words and double jeopardy is not so which ones are fundamental and the court said we're not going to say those right now we're not going to list those we're going to let them come up case by case right by right and, and the court will decide as they come up okay well since then pretty much all the Bill of Rights has been incorporated to the states. All right, the most recent one is the Second Amendment uh, right to bear arms was incorporated in, case, in 2010 in a case called McDonald v. Chicago. All right, and uh, so we see there are little pieces of the, of the Bill of Rights that still haven't been incorporated. The Third Amendment, the Seventh Amendment, there's a piece of the Fifth Amendment involving grand juries. There's a piece of the Sixth Amendment that says you have to have a 12-member jury in a criminal trial. Well, you don't have to have 12. You have to have a jury, but not 12. Uh, there's a piece of the Eighth Amendment that protects you from excessive bails and fines, but pretty much every, all the important rights in the Bill of Rights have been drugged down here to protect you from the states, and this is called incorporation. All right, uh, we'll learn in future videos uh, about the specific language of McDonald v. Chicago, and because McDonald v. Chicago is a very important case that clarified what counts as a fundamental right. Thank you.